So the motion in today's debate is that we should legalise voluntary euthanasia. Um, just as a courtesy, if everybody would turn off their phones, that would be great. Um, speakers will be speaking for 10 minutes, and after each speaker has presented their views, we'll be able to open up the floor um, to questions. So to kick off today's debate, we have Dr. Sarah Edelman. She is the Vice President of Dying with Dignity in New South Wales, a clinical psychologist specialising in anxiety and depression. Um, and she got involved in euthanasia related things after running groups for women with advanced breast cancer. Please give her a warm welcome. Thanks, Sarah. Well, we'd like to think that when our time comes to die, that it will happen peacefully, ideally in our sleep. And of course, we'd like that for our loved ones as well. But unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. For most of us, death will come after a period of illness of an incurable uh, condition. And for some of us, it will not be peaceful. Those, those of us who have had to witness the death of a loved one will know that dying is often difficult. And the period leading up to death, sometimes weeks, months, or even more, often involves suffering. Some illnesses in particular create a great deal of suffering in the period leading up to death. Cancer, which accounts for about 30% of all deaths, is often a very cruel and brutal disease. Before death arrives, people often endure months of pain, discomfort, weakness, disability, agitation, breathlessness and distress. The same is true of the various neurological illnesses and diseases of the immune system, such as AIDS, uh, that affect, and diseases that affect our ability to breathe, and many other diseases that we really don't have time to go into now. I'd like to give you one example. Loredana Mulhall has multiple sclerosis. She is paralysed from the neck down and is totally dependent on other people for the most basic tasks. She cannot feed herself, she cannot hold a glass of water, she cannot scratch herself, she cannot switch on the light, she cannot answer the phone, she cannot roll over in bed. She has no control over the personal bodily functions that we all take for granted. She lives in constant pain and has uncontrollable spasms of her limbs at least a dozen times a day. She struggles with speech, which is becoming increasingly difficult. Until recently, she was able to use the internet which kept her in contact with the world. But earlier this year, she, left, she lost the use of her left hand, and that was her last ability to control aspects of her life. Eventually, this disease will take her life. Loredana has always been a very positive person, and for the moment, she wants to continue living. However, she also wants to know that when her life finally does become unbearable, that she will be able to ha take the option of a peaceful death. The view that we should have the right to, to end our lives peacefully when death is certain and suffering is unavoidable is shared by the majority of Australians. Surveys repeatedly show this. Legalisation of assisted dying is an issue for democracy as well as for human rights. We shouldn't be forced to endure pointless suffering when death is inevitable. Yet our opponents believe that no matter how severe is one's suffering, no one should be allowed to control the timing or the manner of their death. At the centre of this debate is ideology. Our opponents believe that life is a sacred gift from God and only he should decide when death should occur. We believe that dying is very personal. And it is not a decision for God, but for the individual. And when suffering becomes too great, and there is no hope for recovery, we should have the right to end our lives peacefully. We live in a pluralistic society where people hold a range of beliefs, and our opponents know that religious arguments alone will not persuade the majority of people. So instead of declaring their true agenda, they resort to fear-mongering and spin. They conjure up images of the elderly, disabled and vulnerable people too weak to protect themselves being killed by doctors. 
And you'll notice they always use emotive, emotive terms like doctors killing patients rather than talking about a sister dying. So it conjures up images of something that's being done against people's will. They also cherry pick data from overseas studies to distort the picture of what is happening in countries where assisted dying is legal. No, no doubt they'll tell you today that in countries like Holland or Belgium, uh, there are cases of non-voluntary euthanasia. It sounds appalling, doesn't it? People being killed against their will. But what they don't tell you is that non-voluntary euthanasia occurs in every country, including Australia. What we're talking about here is doctor, doctors providing extra medication to hasten death, usually by a few days or a week or so, for someone who is already dying. In three separate studies of Australian doctors, about a third of them in each study acknowledged that they had deliberately hastened death of some of their terminally ill patients by administering more medication that was, than what was necessary to relieve symptoms. In about half of these cases, this occurred without the request from the patient, but the doctors acted because they believed that hastening death was in the best interests of the patient. This happens in Australia, it happens in all Western countries, and it also happens in those countries where, assist, where assisted dying is legal. But the difference there is that people have to account for and report cases where assisted dying happens. Our opponents will also try to generate fear by deliberately confounding the issue of assisted dying with elder abuse. No doubt, our next speaker, Paul Russell, will give you statistics on the rise of elder abuse and tell you that it would be much worse if assisted dying were legal. Paul also likes to bring up the case of uh, Harold Shipman, the uh, convicted English serial killer doctor who murdered 218 people. And he'll tell you that if we legalise assisted dying, that this will give protection to serial killers like Shipman. Elder abuse is terrible, no argument about that. But allowing terminally ill people to choose the manner and the timing of their death does not open the door to elder abuse as long as good safeguards are in place. In fact, I would argue the opposite is true. Under the current law, Australians like Loredana must endure unrelievable suffering against their will for weeks or months or more until they die. If they lived in Oregon, they would have the right to a peaceful death in their home, surrounded by loved ones, at a timing of their choosing. So ask yourself, which system sanctions abuse? Do we need to provide adequate safeguards to protect the vulnerable? Absolutely. Legalisation needs to ensure that a request for assistance is voluntary, that there is the mental capacity to provide consent, that suffering is irreversible, and that other options have been considered. But let us not kid ourselves that it is impossible to provide adequate safeguards. That's just a lame argument by groups with an anti-choice agenda. One of the arguments that you'll hear today is that if assisted dying is legalised, people who are old, disabled, disadvantaged, will feel pressure to end their lives. Well, the evidence certainly doesn't support this to date. A 2007 study reported in the Journal of Medical Ethics looked at who accessed assisted dying in Holland and Oregon. And they found no increase amongst disadvantaged groups, including the elderly, the poor, the disabled, the uninsured, and the psychiatrically ill. On the contrary, people who accessed assisted dying were much more likely to be white, educated, and affluent, basically middle class. About 80% had cancer, and the majority were below 65 years of age. In fact, elderly people were far less likely to access assisted dying than, than the various younger age groups that were looked at. The only group that was overrepresented in this, in this study were people with AIDS, and that was for obvious reasons. Our opponents like to say that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The trouble is that it is broke. When we are young and healthy and we don't have experiences of our loved ones dying, we're often unaware of how traumatic the process of dying can be. But if you ever find yourself in a position where someone you love is slowly dying and they are suffering and they ask for your help to end their nightmare and you can't do anything, then you'll know that the current laws are inadequate. 
And when you plead with the doctor on their behalf, and the doctor is unwilling to help because they're afraid of being prosecuted, and in the end all you can do is pray for death to come, but it doesn't come soon enough, then I think you'll agree that the system is indeed broke. Finally, I want to say that none of us want people to suffer at the end of life, not us and not our opponents. But our opponents believe that suffering at the end of one's life is the preferable option, because to assist someone to end their life is a rejection of God's absolute sovereignty over life and death. Let's be honest about it. That is where our differences truly lie. We believe that forcing someone to endure suffering at the end of life is pointless and cruel. And the timing and the manner of our death should not be a decision for God or the church or for, or for politicians, but for the individual and perhaps their loved ones. Thank you.